Okay, great. I'm going to start because this is a one hour session and I don't want us to waste any time on this important issue. So I'm Faiz Shaheen. I'm the director of CLASS, the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. So just to welcome those joining us on Facebook and those joining us on Zoom. We're really pleased to have this event, at least online. It's sad not to meet in person at Labour Party conference. CLASS always loves and having our stalls in our events um, at Labour Party conference. Um, but we did really want to talk about this issue and um, this issue of so-called levelling up Britain, which you will know is a major slogan that Boris Johnson and his government uses. Um, it was certainly key, uh, a key slogan that he used during the election campaign in 2019. Um, what he exactly means by that um, is hard to say. There hasn't been really any follow up papers that go into um, the types of policies that would deliver um, on a more equal Britain. But the sense is, is that what he talks about is um, the economic performance of London and the South East compared to the rest of the country. Now, for those of us that have worked on inequality for a long time, um, of course, we are pleased to see a Conservative government talk about inequality and say that it is um, going to be a focus. But we also recognise that interregional inequalities are often just as bad as regional inequalities, that this isn't just about economic performance, but it's also about education and health and racism. And if we want to talk about levelling up, um, we really do need to look into all of those issues. Class is putting together a paper with several of the speakers that are going to speak today and um, writing papers for us that will look um, at the various different issues, what, asking the question of what it will really take to level up the UK. Um, we're going to have these great, we've got four great speakers today that will talk about different aspects of levelling up. Um, but it is worth reminding ourselves about the scale of the issue here. So not only have we had uh, deindustrialization, we then had the financial crisis, we've had um, 10 years of austerity that has affected all types of inequalities has pushed us back. Um, and now with COVID-19, where we've seen that the poorest, um, those on the lowest incomes and precarious contracts are being the first to, to lose their jobs, are being most affected in terms of health. Um, and it, as yet, we haven't heard a plan to, for a plan from government on what they're gonna do, even just to say, do something about education and, and what's happened in education. For the last um, for this year great so we've got um four speakers we've got neil mckinroy uh diane ray um uh, kayla shand and danny dorlin so we're going to kick off and i'm going to time everyone we've got five minutes each i know that's not a lot of time but we are asking um, everyone to write questions in the q a box so there's a q a box we haven't got comments open but if you've got questions please do write them in the q a box and i'm going to come back and pick those up um, as the conversation goes on. So firstly to introduce Neil, um, Neil is the uh, CEO of the Centre for Local Economic Strategies. He's been working for a long time looking at um, aspects of devolution, what it would really take to address regional inequalities in this country. So Neil, take it away. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Lovely to be here this afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. I kind of see levelling up as the latest of a long line of phrases, and I'm quite cynical about it, really. I think it's an election slogan. I think it's another brand that's, I think, barely looking for a product, really. Um, it also stands uh, in a history of a long line of probably failure, going right back to the Barlow Commission in the 1940s, the industrial relocation then, Wilson's policies, industrial policy in the 60s, Michael Heseltine's you know, thought softening of Thatcher's deindustrialization with his regeneration. We had New Labour's uh, Regional Development Association, it, Regional Development Agency's policy, possibly high watermark, I should add, uh, in the 90s and 90s. And then we've recently had May's and Osborne's devolution. And it's a pretty sorry tale. Um, and recently, the UK 2070 Commission said that the UK was the most unequal large country in the developing world. Uh, since 2010, London growth has been nine times that of the three northern regions. Things like disposable income in the northeast, it's 16k per head, and in London it's 28k. So there's these regional patterns, but 
it's got even worse than that now. And I think Bowser alluded to that. It's not just about these regional differences. It goes to the smaller social geographies and the intersectionality of lots of other social issues. And I kind of say, well, we say, Claire's the inequality actually knows no compass points. This is a not, not a north-south divide. It knows no compass points today in our country. The uh, one in four children in relative poverty in London, one in four children in relative poverty in Greater Manchester. Uh, the poor people of Hackney need levelling up just as much as the people of Harper Hay in Manchester. Uh, and thinking through what we need to do about this, I mean, there's lots of mid-level policy talk, but I think there's two fundamental big systemic issues. It's power and it's wealth. And the way wealth goes around this country is the great unleveler, particularly financialization, uh, the easy return of London, our city centres through land and property return is the great unleveler. And we've not had a UK economic policy to address that. Financial power is sort of being seen as sacrosanct. So wealth is a key fundamental thing we need to look at here. And secondly, devolution. Um, what we've had in England, certainly, is devolution, is responsibility to deliver austerity. Osborne um, made an Faustian pact with our localities that said, you'll get some devil, you'll get some sweeties off the table, but ultimately you're going to take austerity. Um, so it's power and it's wealth. And it's not unsolvable. It just needs big systemic shifts in terms of how we think about society and economy and who it's for. And that includes, we need a national constitutional convention, I believe. I think we probably need a federal England. We need proper industrial strategy, not what the the governments and a common industrial, a proper beefy industrial strategy with relocation and geography elements into it, a national spatial plan, and of course a political will that rejects the incrementalism and takes financial power uh, on. Now, COVID has exposed and opened the fissures and was, uh, even more than the world before. I do believe we now are seeing a new structural, we are seeing structural economic change and a new economic geography emerging. Our city centres, the localisation, supply chain security, provenance of goods and services, different attitudes to work and commuting. So even without any intervention, we're seeing a different pattern emerging. I just say now, let's imagine if we see what's happening because of COVID as an opportunity to build a greener, fairer, more distributed economy. And what we shouldn't be doing, as, we appear to be, as it appears that we are, we're shoring up the old unequal one. That's all from me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Now, I guess just to come back on you, because you, you were good on your timing, I, one of the things that keeps coming up is that, well, the government or Boris Johnson might do some of this agenda. It's nothing else because they want to keep some of those seats that they want in, in the north. Obviously you've done a, a lot of work, you live in, you live in Manchester. Um, is anything, does it seem like anything's changed? Is there in any sense of more investment or what's your sense of, is there any plan for, in particular for those seats? Because we might imagine that there is at least some, um, you know, cynically thinking political mileage in at least in those areas for them to make some, some changes. <laughs> There's been some war noises, but we've seen no uh, significant, um, uh, definite uh, process of investment in those northern areas. We've got the Northern Powerhouse, but there's another brand looking for a product. And we've got a lot of pleading going on from the northern, from northern agencies to say we need this, we need that. But we're not seeing anything concrete. And I think unless it's wrapped up into a national economic plan, I don't see how it will affect um, really, true, really deal with the systemic problems. We had great, great plans in the 90s with the regional development agencies when New Labour were in power, and we didn't see, we still seen disadvantage then. So it needs to be quite systemic and quite deep. And I just see this as probably a bit of bread and circuses, a bit of some sweeteners, some investment here and there, but nothing to really turn the, uh, the underlying tide in terms of the widening gulf between um, different parts of the UK, but also between rich and poor. Thanks, Now, I guess the, it, the interesting thing that we'll have to watch is how small things like potentially 
um, more bus routes in those areas or a new train link um, or some investment, small investment in, in public transport might be, um, might at least be drummed up to be something more than it really is and, and how that will play out over the next four years. And four years is not a lot of time to change things, especially given what's happened with COVID. Um, I can see the questions are coming in, so please do keep posting them, some really interesting stuff so far. Um, I'm going to turn to Diane now, Di uh, Diane Ray, who's a professor uh, of education at Cambridge and who's going to speak to us about levelling up on the education issue. And of course, we've had a summer where that issue had really come to the fore through the algorithms scandal. Thanks, Diane. Um, levelling up is used by Boris Johnson and others in the right wing political elite. It's a fabrication, a, a linguistic smokescreen designed to obscure policies that work not to level up, but to level down. And listening to Boris, you think the only way is up, that levelling up doesn't require the rich and powerful to do some levelling down of their own. And Boris's assertions are based on the enduring fallacy that everyone has the opportunity to be rich and successful, that there's infinite space at the top of society for those who try hard enough. This is the fairy tale version of British society and ignores persistent and growing inequalities in education. Our actual levelling up would require challenging the protection of their privilege by the upper and middle classes in education and also addressing the lack of economic, social and cultural capital in working class communities. And neither of those things are happening. The repercussions are most evident in schools in working class areas. They're the ones with the least resources, the ones most likely to have buckets collecting rainwater under unrepaired roofs, to have food banks operating in their school halls, to have the narrowest curriculum, the most impoverished pedagogy, the least send resources and the strongest focus on discipline. And these schools are increasingly reflecting the poverty of the locations they're in rather than being able to compensate for it. They're impoverished in terms of infrastructure, curriculum and resources. And this is set to get worse. The IFS report published early this month shows that per spending per pupil will be lower in real terms in 2022-23 than it was in 2009-10. And despite the pupil premium, the, low, the fastest reduction in pupil funding will be in those schools in the most disadvantaged areas. The current national funding formula shows that allocation of funding to schools is dropping more in the disadvantaged areas rather than the more advantaged ones. So, so much for levelling up. And COVID has exacerbated those inequalities. A survey by teachers shows that over 50% of teachers in the more deprived schools say that their pupils are four months or be more behind in terms of academic performance, as compared to only 15% of teachers in more advantaged areas. And then we have the situation with laptops where still a million children do not have access to laptops. As we go into a situation where we are probably going to have repeated local lockdowns, if not another national one. And then of course there's the A-level fiasco, where if there hadn't been a public outcry which forced Boris Johnson and the government into yet another U-turn, privately educated students would have ended up with twice as many A's and A-stars in their A-levels as their state-educated peers. And then there's been the government's so-called rescue package for left-behind children. And rather than invest in state education by funding extra teachers and teaching assistants in working class schools, the government is providing 
more learning support through money that is going to go to the totally unregulated two billion private tuition industry. So over the half of the money will go to commission private tutor agencies to deliver individual and group tuition. And the remaining money going directly into schools is woefully inadequate, representing just under £80 per student with no specification that it be directed at the most disadvantaged. And this would ideally spending per pupil more than 3% below its level in 2010 in real terms. The initiative is obviously a failure in terms of levelling up, but it's definitely been a great successful venture in terms of further privatising our state education system. Um, it's not levelling up that British education needs, but greater fairness and equality. And that would involve narrowing the gaps between the rich and the poor both within and between geographical re regions. A better, less slippery language than levelling up would talk about eradicating poverty and eliminating all forms of special privilege in education. And that would involve the abolition of private schools, but also the elitism that pervades the state sector itself. And the eradication of practices of getting the best for your own child when it's at the expense of other people's children. But many things would also need to change in classrooms. The implementation of a broad and balanced curriculum that integrated the vocational with the academic from nursery onwards, learning that centres democracy, teaches equality, environmental, social and political awareness for all children. And also, we need to put cooperation, trust, compassion, collegiality, and caring at the heart of our educational system. And that would involve getting rid of SATs, lead tables, setting, and Ofsted. We need to also look at what's going on in wider society. Yeah, if I just, just say the, the last bit. The preoccupation with levelling up has focused attention about how to make the bottom of society more like the top. And a more productive dialogue would focus on how to make bottom a good, secure, valued place to be. We need to focus on reducing hierarchy and social distance between different class groupings to the point where notions of top and bottom no longer make sense because we're all in the middle that would be a levelling worth having. Thank you. Great, thanks Diane. Um, for those listening in and, and who haven't looked at Diane's work before, um, her book Miseducation is just excellent on all of this stuff. I was just looking back at it recently. Um, just quickly Diane, just someone just put here, and I think this is, this is there's clearly already a, a clear line of argument coming out from speakers about levelling up being, you know, being an empty slogan. Um, Someone, Keith Robinson has asked, how would you rally pa parents to campaign against these educational inequalities? So you spoke a bit about the you know, seismic shift we need to have in our thinking, um, but have you got any ideas? And I'll come back to you again, but if you've got something to say now on that question, that would be great. Well, I actually feel quite hope hopeful. I mean, I think the A-level fiasco was bringing together a grassroots groups of parents, um, teachers, and also pupils themselves in a very effective way. And, and I think there's, there's some of the public um, opinion surveys show that people's views are shifting in terms of their commitment to what I would call, you know, people who've been undervalued and underpaid in our society. Um, and also that includes teachers and schools in under-resourced and more disadvantaged areas. So I think there's, there's more of a, a grassroots sense that we need both a fairer society and a fairer educational system. Great, thank you for that, Diane. And we'll come back and, uh, again after uh, Kailish and Danny have spoken. But it is worth remembering that um, the National Education Union had 20,000 new members join over the summer. 
Um, and there certainly is a groundswell of young people I know locally in this area, for instance, that went out and went to those protests outside the Department of Education and um, 10 Downing Street and, you know, shouting justice for the working class. Um, so, yeah, there is something there to, to give us hope. Um, turning to you, Dr. K uh, Kailish Chand, who you're the honorary vice president of um, Brit the British Medical Association. Um, and you were the ex deputy chair. Um, obviously, health has been uh, a real focus of this year, um, and it's hard. I mean, I'm not a health expert, and that's why we've got you on this um, call. But it's very hard to think of where we go from here, given the state the NHS is in. I mean, we've had ten years of underfunding, and now they've had um, a pandemic to deal with. So, um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Faza, and thank you for having me. Uh, let me warn all viewers that I'm very, very pessimistic. I think the previous speaker did talk about uh, that leveling up is just a lip service. And in my view, as a matter of fact, I was looking into the history of inequalities. And uh, funnily enough, uh, a Professor Harari from Israel, he's done a book, a History of Mankind. And in that, he very clearly says, that if you look at the history of inequalities, it has come right from 30,000 years ago when there was an agricultural revolution and then went on to scientific revolution and now whatever we have today, inequalities have grown bigger, bigger, bigger. And as far as then health is concerned, very recently in February, my guru, I call him my guru, Professor Sir Michael Mamet, he had his uh, 10 years review and he showed the mirror as far as health is concerned about the inequalities. And in his report, he very clearly says that first time since 1900, the life expectancy is going to be stalled. And he talked about the huge difference between North and South. And until unless that leveling up comes up, things will never ever improve. Now, COVID, as you very rightly said that, COVID has really affected not only health of the country, economy of the country as well, and the both are interrelated. Healthier you are, prosperous you are. Poorer you are, and unhealthy you are. The truth is uh, the COVID, actually, if you look into it, the people who got, what I say is COVID, it doesn't distinguish who it attacks, but it does discriminate who actually gets killed or is mortality or goes higher up in that. Four groups, either people who are elderly, people who had comorbidities like heart disease, diabetes, people from BAM communities. And the fourth one was people from deprived communities. And now if you do analysis and look at it, even elderly, even people with comorbidities and people from BAM communities, everybody fulfilled that criteria that they essentially were from poor and deprived communities. All these leaders want to tell us that, yes, we understand these inequalities and these inequalities got to be really narrowed down. But truth is, just go back, look at, I, I came to this country in 1978 and immediately after that was Margaret Thatcher. And you remember Margaret Thatcher's uh, 10 Downing Street speech? She was also talking about the hope, the harmony, and discord, all those kind of things. And what did she do uh, her 13 or 14 years? She actually brought that difference between have and have nots so bigger. And particularly my health sector started suffering from Margaret Thatcher's time in which exactly she wanted to bring in the private sector. And that journey is going on right to day to day. Uh, look in COVID, what exactly Sonok, uh, Rishi Sonok did say, you will get what you want for NHS. That was his slogan. Who got the money? Whatever money was, you see what happened with test every money or every penny has got into so-called failed, whether it was Serco or other private organizations. Truth is, uh, the money for the NHS again went to the private sector and public sector or what exactly the, this problem could have been solved in my view by decentralizing, getting the test done at local level, primary care level, local authorities, nothing happened. Then what exactly has gone on, as you very rightly said, 10 years of austerity, Lensley did one, one very, very bad thing was when he took public health away from NHS and given it to the local authorities. And what happened after that, budgets of local authorities were cut by 40%. 
and public health has really gone down like anything. And truth is, uh, in 2016, uh, there was a rehearsal done that if there is a pandemic, how what we will be able to do and what we won't be able to do. And one big thing in that was uh, that we got to have enough PPEs, that is personal protection equipments. And we know what happened. Personal equipments were absolutely lacking in most of the hospitals. So the truth is, uh, if you really want to tackle the whole big issues of health inequalities. Health inequalities are not just by funding. Even funding, we know what has happened to the funding of NHS. 1948, until 10 years ago, the rise in NHS funding was anything excess of 4.6%. In those 10 years, that funding went down to 1.6%. So in a way, we are already in a very, very bad shape as far as uh, the health funding is concerned. And if you want to have health inequality addressed, you got to look into poverty, you got to look into education, you got to look into housing. So all those factors are terribly important. And do you think this government in any way is honest or putting funds there uh, to really level up? So my conclusion is that there isn't any leveling up. It's just talk, it's just lip service. And another, th another thing which I want to leave you with is with the advance in technology, with advance in genetics, with advance in artificial intelligence, what we talked about, the so-called economic equality could even turn into a biological inequality. What I mean is if you look at the history of evolution, there was something which happened um, several thousands years ago, chimpanzee too, we became human race. Now with this have nots going to that level where a time come where the have nots, they might not consider them as being human beings and they could be a totally different ball game altogether. So it's high time. We really don't talk about it. Don't be passionate as a socialist that we're going to narrow this gap of have and have nots. We have to fight for it. We got to really look into it. Otherwise, the humanity is doomed. Simple as that. Thank you, Dr. Chand, for that really important reminder of really the scale of those health inequalities. And the only way that you're able to get away with inequalities of the scale we're talking about, whether in education or health, is where you dehumanize um, the poorest. And we saw a very strong push to, you know, talk about skivers and strivers and all of that sort of language that has very much seeped into public consciousness and is the reason, um, to some extent, that the conservatives are able to get away with this. Um, Turning now to Danny Dorling, and we'll come back with some more questions. There's people, do you keep writing your questions? I can see there's um, some really good ones I'll read out in a minute. I mean, it's, it's striking listening to, to those three speakers, you know, whether regional education, health, um, it definitely, there's a definite sense that the government uh, are actually doing the opposite to leveling up in lots of ways. Um, and people have asked questions about and how we expose this government. But before we get to that, um, it'd be really helpful, Danny, I know you've looked at this. So Professor Danny Dorlin, who needs no introduction, but is, the, um, is a professor of human geography at the University of Oxford. Um, you, what are your thoughts just listening to those speakers? And you've worked, at, you've worked on inequalities for many, for many years. We met many years ago as well, you know, where we had some hope that we could keep pushing and things would change, but yet here we still are. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm going to be optimistic, um, but I'm going to be a bit cynical as well. I'm going to start with a quote, and I'll end with this quote. Uh, the quote is by a Prime Minister, so you have to try and guess who the Prime Minister was, but I think this quote kind of helps explain why we get this kind of thing in Britain. So here's the quote. This country is a blessed nation. The British are special. The world knows it. In our innermost, innermost thoughts, we know it. This is the greatest nation on earth. Now, because our prime ministers say things like that, we can end up with phrases like levelling up, or a rising tide lifts all boats, or the big society, or all the other trite uh, that we've had over the years of meaningless things that even they don't actually believe in, honestly, themselves. Absolutely don't believe in themselves, but they think they can treat other people as ignorant. Um, 
and they work to try to ensure that people are looking at humans so that they can do this one slogan after another just two words occasionally three words i've been asked about the trend in inequality uh, in the uk it has got dramatically worse we have become the most unequal country in europe by income inequality however by 2018 we possibly reached a peak 2019 the pay of top bosses actually fell the high pay commission uh, report this the treasury claimed about a month ago that all their covid uh, special measures has reduced inequalities but they were lying uh, you could simply look at the references they gave which said the opposite uh, an extra 20 pound a week on universal credit didn't reduce inequality so covid has made the poorest poorer particularly people who fit out of the nets, uh, the safety nets that they put in. But at the same time, the highest paid has seen a dent and I won't go on about it, but it's fascinating. If the London housing market is reducing, the London estate agents want to tell you that house prices are shooting up in London. But tens of thousands of people haven't arrived in the last six months into London. More than tens of thousands have left to live somewhere else because why do you why would you rent in London when you can't go into the office? The majority of wealth in Britain is held in the form of housing, particularly in London South East, and secondly, pensions. So we're in a really interesting time for inequality. It might actually be teaching nothing to do with the government, a lot to do with the pandemic. Um, I was asked to say, if I was a government advisor, what would I advise the government to do? I wouldn't. I would tell them to resign. They are disingenuous. Johnson and Cummings have never done anything constructive in their lives. They can break things, they cannot make them, they are incapable. And I was simply tell them to resign. I do not work with this government. I'm asked numerous times by the civil service to do things with this government and I simply say no, it would be immoral. They have to go uh, because of how extreme they are. Uh, Neil mentioned Osborne's austerity and I would have, you know, with that, but the delusion, the delusion of this government, Osborne in 2015 said, if we followed his great economic plan, in about a year 2030, just 10 years from now, Britain would be the richest, highest per capita GDP large country on the planet. Right? That was the kind of thinking that Osborne had. We've got to realise what a lunacy we've been living in for the last five or, or ten years. Um, Diane mentioned the IFS report, which actually showed that the cuts we've had in state education, it's not levelling down because the cuts have only been to state education, not to private education. The largest cuts in 40 years is what the IFS reported. The largest cuts in 40 years. But the IFS did a report two days earlier as well, which claimed, I was wrong, but claimed that you could entirely predict whether a young person went on to do postgraduate study on their exam results when they were 11 and 15. Um, now, of course, to do postgraduate study, you've got to be able to afford to do it. So, um, and this country gets so many things so terribly, terribly wrong because we're so unlevel. Uh, Kalish, talking about health, and this is why I've got to be optimistic. I can see your anger, but things do not always inevitably go worse. And I'm going to do a terrible thing, but I'm going to stick a book up because it's, this is published next week. I'm not doing another book for ages. It's called Fintopia. It's about the most equal country in Europe, possibly the most equal country in the world. Lowest infant mortality rate on the planet ever. Fewer than 100 babies died in 2015. Best educational uh, results on the planet. Uh, eliminated homelessness. I, it scores first, second or third in over 110 international statistics and they leveled. Not up, they leveled out. You don't level up unless you're stupid. Um, you can't make everybody's house the price of Kensington. You can't spend £30,000 on everybody's education. You don't need to. You don't get a good education for £30,000. You get eaten, and it's a terrible, terrible, bad education. Um, so to end, let me read out the quote again and tell you who it is. So that This country is a blessed nation. The British are special. The world knows it. In our innermost thoughts, we know it. This is the greatest nation on earth. It wasn't Thatcher, it wasn't Major, it wasn't Cameron, it wasn't May, it wasn't Johnson. It was actually Tony Blair in his resignation speech on the 10th of March 2007. Britain has a big, big problem with its political leaders and thinking. It has a sense of superiority, which means it doesn't look to other countries in Europe, which are all more equal. Instead, when some imbecile of a prime minister talks about levelling up, we 
take him seriously and we've got to stop doing that now because it's stupid and it's wrong and it's damaging and people will die thank you very much thank you danny for that i um i'm going to read out some questions now so, and then come back to you all um a, a, one of them is really how to get info out there about what you're talking about these huge disparities us moving in the other direction in lots of places um, and as I mentioned, how we expose um, the difference between rhetoric and action that this government is taking. So any ideas on that um, would be great. I'm going to just read out some questions now. There's quite a few education ones, Diane, um, and a few on health as well. Um, so firstly, um, Anna Dutz, um, given the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on BAME communities, um, already suffering from structural inequalities, um, is there not a case for a minister in cabinet solely responsible um, to, to uh, work on inequalities? I mean, I would say yes, but whether we'll ideolo ideologically get this government to do that. Just, just to mention, um, quite shocking, after the George Floyd murder and the, um, the protests on Black Lives Matter, um, the government then came out and said they were going to do yet another commission and of course have ignored all of the recommendations from um, past commissions on racism. Um, but when they invited uh, anti-racist uh, activists and um, academics to come and give um, uh, evidence to uh, the committee, one of the key questions, there was only three questions, but one of them was, is it helpful to talk about white privilege given the situation of the white working class? Um, and so it was very clear that this race commission is really going to be about culture war and about going back to dividing the working class. So, you know, um, the way in which culture, the whole culture war arguments and who's singing what at the proms is going to be used to distract from absolute government incompetence and failure on this agenda and many others is something we really need to watch out for and we'll make things more toxic going forward. So any thoughts you have on that would be really helpful. Um, so there's a question here about um, issues surrounding ingrained intergenerational inequality need to be tackled. Um, uh, any, any ideas on that? Um, Kate Lomas here says, I work in further education in English and maths. The best opportunities for levelling up um, but, uh, but are seriously underfunded, the further education sector. Um, we are now teaching just one lesson, 75 minutes per week. And um, does the Labour Party recognise the need to invest and review the endless GCSE resets? We didn't manage to get a, um, someone from the Labour Party, an MP on the call, but I think there's a real, there's a real push. I saw that there's some private schools and um, academy chains coming together to put together a new um, commission on ending GCSEs. So it's interesting that that moves happening within the education sector. And Diane, you might want to pick up on that. Um, it's something that you might want to pick up on nil on infrastructure to make walking and cycling more attractive and how that would assist the most disadvantaged groups, how to push that agenda. Um, a question on rural poverty um, and how that often gets overlooked. Um, gosh, there's so many questions now, I'm going to have to miss some. Um, Okay, this is a good one. As 80% of the economy is in services and arguably services follow existing wealth in the South, how can we ensure better jobs come to the rest of the UK? Okay, Neil, if you could pick that up, that would be great. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, Danny, you spoke there about, you know, just this government needing to resign, but there is a real question about the way in which our democratic system works. I mean, Noah also spoke about power um, and there's a question about how we can transform the way in which government is elected to deliver, to deliver a more representative cabinet. I know in past research I've done, um, governments with proportional representation tend to be much better on these issues. It might be something from Finland um, that you can draw on there. And I thought it was quite interesting that um, quite a few people here said, well, what can we do to level up? And it sounds like from what you're talking about is to be more like Finland um, in terms of policies. Um, just a thought here from uh, Duncan Dalton. Um, is it really incompetence on the part of Tories or is it based deliberate ideological policy? Um, and I think 
Um, sometimes we do think it's kind of a sense of like they just don't know what policies will work but those of us that have worked on these issues for a long time and saw actually a lot of money go in under the Tony Blair government and still the failure to really um, address these issues we recognize that it is it is an ideological standpoint I'll stop there because I want to give you all sort of um, five minutes to answer and consider but I think one of the big things that would be really helpful to get your thoughts on is really you know, all of this rage we feel about so many things, um, you know, what can we do with it at this point? Um, and of course, having these conversations and listening to you and knowing that we're not alone, all of the people that have written questions and answers, um, have written questions, um, you know, you can often feel in your living room, especially during lockdown, you know, shouting at the telly that we, uh, you know, that huge frustration. So, um, yeah, any, any, positive thoughts on how we can manage our rage uh, uh, to get the change we want to see would be good as well. Um, I'm going to start with, let's start with you, um, Kayla, uh, Dr. Chand. Wait, you're still muted. That's it. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Yes. I think my answer would be what actually we need is uh, political will. We all know what needs doing. We know the solutions, but the truth is there's no willpower to do it. I, I again quote uh, Michael Marmot. Michael Marmot was actually looking into West Africa water supply. Most of 80% of the diseases in West Africa were because of water, simple as that. So he then calculated and looked at it and whole West Africa could be supplied with a safe water supply by $200 billion. That's the cost he put into it. And when he asked for it, WHO and all that, nothing ever came. And what he said was, we all remember the financial crisis, don't we? And do you know how much money was pumped into in financial crisis? To the tune of almost $2 trillion. So when there was a political will, you will do anything. And if there's no political will, all these things just become a political campaign. What we have seen in the last few months, particularly with Boris Johnson, he does even management of pandemic being a political campaign. He would want to give a statement without ever thinking how to implement what the action plan is. So in a way, I think until unless that political will comes in, nothing can ever be translated into re-election. I guess just quickly, just to pick up, I'm just interested on um, interested in what the sense is in the health sector in terms of the anger at what's happened. We know with, you know, some years back when the junior doctors um, uh, protested against government changes and there's been a huge amount of anger of people working in NHS and social care in terms of how they've been treated by various governments um, since uh, Tory government since 2010. But I'm just wondering if you could give us a sense of, you know, where the health sector is, like the level of anger, because one of the things that really strikes me when we have a Tory majority government is to the extent to which things can happen in government is limited. But I'd just be interested in what, organi what organizing is being done within the health community to really fight back. Faza, you are absolutely right. The anger in medical profession is massive, huge. Not with this government, it's been going on with the successive governments, let it put that way. But with, particularly with this government, we all know what happened with PPE. You see, most of the hospitals were not equipped with the PPE and so many doctors. I think we have the highest doctor's death in the whole world. Then look at the other thing also. Now, what I'm worrying about is the anger is going to mount like anything. During this pandemic, non-COVID diseases were put on the back burner. So now backlog of non-COVID diseases is huge. I think NHS Confederation said that 10 million people are waiting. God knows how many people have died because they didn't get the cancer treatment, how many people died with the heart attack. All these things, chronic diseases management, vaccination, everything is on back burner. And there isn't a workforce to deal with it. You know, on 30th of January, uh, what was the status of the healthcare? We were 100,000 um, health workers short. That included 10,000 doctors and 40,000 nurses. That's the situation 
prior to the pandemic and now post pandemic when the workload comes in do we have the workforce do we have uh, the funding do we have the resources answer is no so when we're talking about leveling up just look at it the kind of things we're going to face the problem again we've been clapping giving everything to health workers making them heroes and all that that will dissipate i think in two seconds and i'm very worried that the level of anger will really just mount like anything and uh, pay rise you must have recently seen that uh, it came to when junior doctors again pay wasn't given to them because their pay was calculated that they already been given in their three year deal or blah blah whatever same thing happened with the primary care with the gps so anger level is massive and huge until unless you deal with that i'm sure we are in for a very bad time in nhs Thank you for that. It's really helpful to understand what the feeling is within the NHS. They're all very understandable. Um, and, you know, if a Labour politician was here, it's really on the Labour Party to um, also talk about uh, the level of dissatisfaction and to keep highlighting the problems. Um, Diane, I'm going to come to you just to pick up on some of those education questions, but just to talk kind of your thoughts more generally about what we can do at this point. You know, I I, I recognise the rage too, but I, I do think that it, it needs to go into grassroots mobilisation. And we have seen some positive examples of that. I mean, not just the A-level fiasco, but, but also um, Black Lives Matters has been really hopeful and generative. And then Marcus Rushford was just amazing. Um, and he sort of um, stirred up enormous public support for his actions. So, I mean, I, I, I do think that we need to keep on putting on the pressure. And, and of course, Class does a brilliant job and he's doing a brilliant job. And Boris is, is not like, you know, Margaret Thatcher was not for turning. I mean, Boris will twist and turn um, in order to maintain his popularity and his polling rate. But I suppose at the same time, we, we need to remember this party, you know, this government is very much a party, a government of the rich for the rich. And that is becoming more and more evident. You know, at the moment, Boris is carping about not having enough money, being too hard up to maintain what he calls a decent lifestyle. So, I mean, this, this government is horrendously out of touch with ordinary people. I mean, I, I don't know what to say about the Labour Party. <laughs> I'm very involved. <laughs> but I mean, I, we, should be, we should be much more involved in this grassroots mobilization. Yes. Um, and, and supporting people on the ground. And, and I don't think we, we're doing enough of, of that at the moment. And, and I think I'm, you know, I'm comfortable in that probably too. Great. Thanks, Diane. Thank you for that. Um, Danny, I'm going to come to you. There's also a question here you said about levelling up. Should we just refuse to use levelling up? Is it, do we not want to play into the Tory agenda and instead, um, you know, use our own terms like Diane put earlier, like eradicating poverty and ending elitism? Um, yeah, is that, yeah, would that be helpful? Is that, that's one of the uh, questions. Well, and there was, sorry, Danny, just quickly, and one more thing, um, just because people are still mailing in questions. Um, uh, just really about, um, just drawing on the poverty point about how much um, tackling poverty and child poverty and um, that aspect of inequality could be a focus um, going forward. Thanks, Danny. Okay. Um, I think we should say things like levelling up properly or levelling up and not pretending to do it. Um, I mean, you don't want to be completely rude, but you do want to realise you're not in the situation of a constructive debate with this government. Uh, they will talk about building 40 hospitals. Some of them will be very tiny. Uh, they don't want to actually make the country more equal. Johnson is on the record of saying he believes the top cornflakes, which is the phrase he used for himself, a special, and um, Cummins has written a thesis about how inequality is okay, and people like him are much better than other people. So they've actually told us that they don't believe in levelling up. Uh, and given that, you really mustn't fall for it and, and have a debate with them. I do agree with Diane's optimism I'm gonna, about the A-level and the GCSEs. So just let me say very quickly about that. And this is 
This happened in the 1930s as well. Uh, the A-level protests were led by students who were trying to get into Maya and Diane's university. This is Oxford and Cambridge. And they'd slipped by one grade. And they were quite posh kids who'd often gone to a comprehensive, but posh kids. And they got A star A, B. And because they hadn't got A star A, A, they weren't going to get in. And they really were vocal. But the result of them protesting and others, and you didn't see people protesting who got free seats, saying, I want BCC, because you don't do that. But the results of, of middle class and quite posh kids protesting and the embarrassment talks in Cambridge colleges was so great that the algorithm was changed. And the biggest effect of this was not on the A-level students, it was on the GCSEs where the algorithm was changed. Uh, and so loads of kids who were going to get a three or a four GCSE got a five or six. That's life changing. That's the equivalent in old money of your five A to Zs. Um, and, and why I hark back to this is back in the late 1930s, the middle class would began to complain because they couldn't afford a doctor and they needed an NHS. It wasn't just a working class that got it. So things are going to get tricky. They're very tricky already. Brexit makes it even worse. Uh, and you're in a situation where but I think we've got to get rid of this politeness. Um, it's got too serious for that. And you don't want to be outright rude, but you do not want to be fooled into engaging with a debate on the terms of Dominic Cummings and whatever Boris Johnson has been told to say that day for as long as he manages to last in office. Um, it's going to be some, a bad few uh, years ahead. However, it really, we spend more on education in other countries. It's just that we waste it, a third of it, on private schools. And if it produced super intelligent kids from those schools that, you know, were world beating in terms of their ability to, I don't know, run track and trace, okay, but it doesn't. So it's not a question of money. We have enough housing in this country. We just have more second and third homes and more empty homes and more empty bedrooms because we distribute our housing so unequally. So we don't actually have to build a huge amount to house people. Uh, you know, don't be, uh, don't be pessimistic about how fast things could actually change. And in a way, Johnson and Cummings, by creating such a disaster, making it worse, um, you know, uh, may, may in some way actually be, be helping. Um, whereas if they showed some competence, if they actually were able to get a grip on this pandemic in a way that other countries have and they haven't, if they showed some competence about negotiating so we actually have the deal over Brexit, but they don't. Um, but they are pushing us into a situation where people who are pretty well off like those students who slipped an A grade by one, are going to find their lives made much, much worse than before. And that, when that happens, is when you do get the kind of changes that Britain needs. And the last thing to say, we do have to say it, you do not become the most unequal country in Europe without your social democratic party also being a bit incapable. It's not just the Conservatives who achieved this inequality, it was also negligence on the part of the Labour Party over 30 or 40 years. And Labour needs to realise that. Thanks, Annie. Thank you for that. Um, just really quickly, someone on Facebook has asked, um, because it, and this will happen to you and it happens to me all the time, is that we'll talk about inequality getting worse. And of course, we see that in the rich list and food banks and, you know, in, in so many different ways. And people say, but the Gini coefficient has got better. Um, someone has asked, like, what what is your stock answer to that? Like, why why is Gini, you know, what can we say about the Gini coefficient that's being wrong? Or... Oh, no, no, it may have got better in the last two years. Um, inequality might have peaked in 2018. Uh, the problem with Gini coefficient is the best of 1% hide a large amount of their income through tax dodging. Yeah. And if you put in the estimates of how much income they get, which they don't declare, because this is all based on tax records, uh, then you may find it hasn't gone up. However, the pandemic may well have hurt people in the top 1% um, more because they had stuff to lose, uh, whereas people at the bottom had so much less to lose. Uh, but the last thing to, 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 to leave you on over this, and, it, and this is why stoicism is required, inequality last peaked in this country in 1918. It then fell for all the 1930s and all, all the 20s and all the 30s. But people didn't notice, and those were awful decades. There was a general strike in 1926, a crash in 29, mass unemployment in the 30s. As, in, as inequality falls, 
it isn't sudden utopia. It is the rich being a, not allowed to be as greedy. It's a slow coming uh, together. That's 20 years and nobody noticed, you know, until the late 1940s. Uh, so, you know, you can't promise jam, um, you know, immediately tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, and, and this is what, in Finland, it took them three generations to create what they've created. And incredibly hard work, but just to make you feel, some Finns came over to Britain in the 1960s and to the US and observed the civil rights movement there and so on. And they took the messages back and they took progressive labor politics from the 60s in London back to Helsinki. Mm -hmm. You know, so even though we failed here miserably, um, at least we can look a bit at those countries of Europe, which are many of them, which are so much more constructive, where they treat each other as if they are all human beings, uh, where they control their greedy and their rich. And we can think, actually, we had a part to play on that, not least because by the late 1960s, along with Sweden, we were the most equitable large country in Europe. You know, things do change. Mm. Um, and they, they will change again. But not, not if we give any tolerance to Johnson and the Conservative government's talking about this because they are utterly disingenuous. Great, thanks Danny. I think that's a really important distinction to make just because this government isn't willing to do it. This government doesn't have the ideas or the, really the, the will to do it doesn't mean it can't be done and that there aren't ideas there ready to be used. I guess just one thing that I know that a lot of us feel is that we can't wait three generations in particular because of the climate crisis. And so coming to you now, it'd be really helpful to get your thoughts on some of the questions that were asked on the economy and um, on manufacturing, for instance, and in particular, if you could try and say something about what we could do on green investment. I know um, when the financial crisis happened and, and not long after I moved to work at the New Economics Foundation and they'd just done this paper on the Green New Deal um, which would have been just exactly the sort of thing we could have done at that time, made big investments and just think how far we would have been now. Um, and we're still having a campaign that is pretty much similar, the similar ideas of the types of um, injections of investment we need. Um, but yes, yeah, so it'd be good to get your thoughts on that. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm really enjoying the, the comments from our fellow panelists. It's great. And uh, yes, I mean, obviously we need, like any decent country, you have a proper sorted industrial strategy that, that looks to where we are now and where we need to go, given um, societal, economic, climate shifts. And we don't have one, frankly. We don't have a proper industrial strategy that, that deals with the climate emergency and deals with the structural economic change that COVID is inducing on our, on our lives and our economy. So we need a proper industrial strategy, which in a sense is a Green New Deal. It needs to make the big transition. And um, we can't leave it, we had a structural economic change in the 80s, this is going to be worse. We can't leave it to the market. We can't play around the edges with some nonsense around levelling up. We need to have a serious, muscular um, intervention in the economy to position it from where we are going to where we need to actually head. And in the absence of that, we will um, frankly not be able to deal with the climate emergency and we won't be able to deal with the horrible mass unemployment that's happening and the destitution that will come with it. So there is no other alternative but a proper muscular industrial strategy. I mean, just look at retrofitting of houses or rewilding the environment. These could all create huge jobs. And saying all that, there's some interesting little things happening. This great country of ours has actually got brilliant things happening. It happens in spite of the system. Imagine if we've got a system that actually worked for it. For instance, in Birmingham at the moment, what we're doing with a number of large anchor organizations in Birmingham, there's a hospitality to health program, which is in sensing, we know hospitality will, is dying or partly dying. There'll be less jobs probably in the hospitality sector. Let's take that and let's repurpose those workers into health workers because we need more social care and public health workers. Th that could be done. We just need a massive plan to make the transition of what people used to do to start doing things that's actually socially useful and purposeful and cut out those bullshit jobs. Yeah, but we don't really have a plan for it. But there is all around us, there's these seeds of some great stuff. We just don't have the soil conditions politically and 
policy terms to make them actually glow and flourish. Um, I don't want to go on, Faisal, but I just want to pick on that point about political mobilisation, which I think was a fantastic point and really important for people listening in. I think we have, I'm optimistic in a sense that injustice prompts anger and belligerence. And goodness hell, we've got lots of injustice and anger. But what we shouldn't rely on is our, polit our political parties to think they can capture that, or at least the political parties the way they're formed at the moment. I think we need new forms of political activism, new form that harnesses that plurality, that horizontal power, if you like, and harnesses in different ways. And I don't think we're there yet with the political parties, but I do think we do need to get onto those streets and we need to start to mobilize and create plural connections between people like we've never done before. And I think there's seeds of that across the country, but it needs a political party, the Labour Party, whoever it may be, to actually see this and start to reform their structures and processes to capture that anger and belligerence in all its plural forms and start to create a new party or a, a reform party that can truly take on the vertical power from that horizontal energy that's all around us. Thank you for that, Mel. It's really interesting thoughts there. And, you know, we don't know what's going to happen over the next, even the next few months, let alone uh, the next few years under the Tories. But certainly one thing that has been confirmed today is that certainly the government's uh, agenda and Boris Johnson's slogan of levelling up is a farce and we will see that play out. And there'll be various things that we need to do to highlight um, the abs absolute hypocrisy of this government. Um, and someone put on the Q&A, the activists need short, um, a series of short pamphlets to help with some of this. So just to say, class, um, we have a paper, um, which Diane and Neil and Ka uh, Kailish are all gonna write for, um, which is um, gonna be about uh, leveling up and we will have papers on climate, on wages, on all different aspects that will hopefully give you some of those arguments. But of course, um, CLASS, which is uh, funded by um, a number of trade unions, is always looking to um, give our activist base um, those, those tools to have those conversations, because that's absolutely what we need to be doing right now, that whilst we can keep talking about these issues, keep highlighting uh, the discrepancies in your family homes, in your workplaces, outside school gates. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely imperative that we keep talking about these issues and highlighting um, just, just where the government and how much they are doing that is wrong. Um, I know there was loads of other people that wanted to, that had some questions and I, I thank you for engaging, but I hope we managed to get the main part of those. Um, all of the speakers today, um, have written blogs for class, have um, websites and ways that, and books and uh, things that you can read and uh, to catch up on. And the paper we plan to put out before the budget, we're not kind of, we're not really sure where the budget is going to be now, um, but we're hoping to put the paper out in October. So we'll be in touch and we'll have some kind of event then as well. So thank you for joining us. We had um, over a hundred people on um, the, Zoom, the Zoom link, but also more on Facebook. So it's been a great evening. And uh, thank you to the speakers that have given us so much energy and thoughts. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.